hello and welcome to this month's first Thursday Club. Um, it's great that so many people have managed to join us this month uh, for what I'm sure is going to be a really interesting topic on delivering biodiversity net gain on site. Um, my, our presenter this month is Mark Lang, who's an associate director at RSK Biosensors. He specializes in, in plants and habitat side of things, so he can answer all of your questions. Um, I'm not answering any at the end, Mark. Um, and, and he's going to talk about some observations, pitfalls and lessons learned in, in biodiversity net gain over, over the last year or so. So, Mark, if you could just Thank you very much. I'll just do the, the air hostess housekeeping part. Um, first of all, to say that all your microphones are automatically on mute, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, if you want to ask a question, please use the questions box in the control panel at the side of your screen, um, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can at the end of the, of the presentation today. Um, shortly after we finish the webinar today, we will send out a short feedback survey. So if you have got a couple of minutes to spare, we'd really appreciate it if you could if you could jot down some answers to that. Let us know how you how you got on with it today, and any other topics, things you'd like us to cover. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to turn off my webcam, Mark, and hand over to you for the presentation. OK, hi, guys. Um, just to say hello, so good afternoon. I'm going to turn my camera off now so you don't have to look at me whilst I'm presenting. So hopefully that's uh, that one. Hopefully that's off. Good. You need to share your screen, Mark. Uh, show screen. Right, hopefully you can see it. Yeah, can you see Steph? Yes, that's fine now, yes. thank you. So what I'm going to cover today is a brief introduction to biodiversity net gain, exploring some implications for achieving net gain, particularly small development sites, how we might make it more achievable, a number of case studies that I found quite interesting and just touching on some good practice principles really. So first thing, what is biodiversity net gain? So net gain is simply an approach to development that leaves biodiversity in a better state than before. So where development is impacting on biodiversity, this approach encourages developers to provide an increase in appropriate habitat and features over and above that being affected. So if all goes to plan, hopefully we can address the current loss of biodiversity through development and we can restore ecological corridors and networks. And the Environment Bill will mandate biodiversity net gain in England and has proposed a target of net gain for the majority of development. However, first thing just to say straight off this isn't a green light to development and you can't just write a check now to deliver biodiversity offsite and all your problems go away so we still need to be aware that we need to go through the normal planning processes checks and balances that are in place and particularly considering the mitigation hierarchy so i just wanted to get this slide in first so we still need to avoid where possible we still need to mitigate if we can't avoid, and then we compensate if we can't mitigate. So just to make that point, it's not going to be a simple pay a biodiversity tax green light for development. It doesn't work that way. So there are some exemptions from the mandatory 10% net gain. Major infrastructure projects, so these are the NSIPs, the big you know, new motorways, new power stations, that type of thing, and marine sites. And these projects will, sorry about that, and these projects will normally have their own bespoke um, biodiversity mitigation. Certain brownfield sites, particularly if they don't contain protected or priority habitats, or if they face genuine viability difficulties. This is reflecting the government's push for development on brownfield and also recognizing that brownfield can be contaminated and expensive to remediate. However, we do need to remember brownfield is often very good for biodiversity, often better than um, greenfield. So it doesn't always go the government's way. And also small minor development, say less than 10 residential units or an area of less than half a hectare. This is likely to be a simplified metric and potentially lower than 10% net gain. But we haven't seen what the simplified metric is going to look like. And also building extension projects. <laughs> 
As well as that, there are some habitat and species exemptions. So habitats deemed irreplaceable, such as ancient woodland, there's a presumption of against trying to develop on such sites, and we shouldn't really be using the DEFRA metric to design compensation for those. And also statutory designated sites, so SSSR, European sites, etc. Now, there are obviously cases where development will have an effect on sites like this. Good example would be HS2. You can't put a straight line between two points without having an effect on something, and that's where bespoke mitigation would come in. Um, we also need to remember that legally protected species are not covered or considered in the metric. The metric is assuming that if you get the habitats right, the species will follow. But what's important to note is that if you do have legally protected species, be it great crested newts, dormice, whatever, you will deal with them in the same way that you deal with them at the moment. So through mitigation and licensing if required. There is a bit of crossover here. If you're creating habitat, for legally protected species, then clearly you can account for that in your biodiversity net gain. So if you're building new ponds or planting new woodland for dormice, whatever it may be, then fine, that can be considered within the metric and considered as part of your net gain. But what you can't consider within the metric is elements of provision for species. So high binacular for great crested newts, dormouse boxes for dormice, that type of thing. The metric doesn't have a mechanism to consider that. So that's just something we need to be aware of. So briefly, what the metric looks at. So it looks at three broad groups of habitat. So linear features like hedgerows, linear water features, and then other habitat it considers in area terms. An important thing to understand is you can't trade between the three categories. So if all three are affected by a development, you need to know show net gain for each three. So for example, if you're planting a new hedge, you get biodiversity gain in hedgerow terms, but you can't set that biodiversity gain against the loss of woodland area. You would need to do some kind of habitat in area terms to compensate for that. And generally, in terms of habitat creation, we're trying to avoid trading down. So if we're losing woodland, we're trying not just to create species poor grassland because you would need a huge amount of it to compensate for the woodland you're losing. What the metric does is for your baseline, so this is your development site or your project site, whatever it may be at project start, it will give each habitat that's present a distinctiveness and an ecological condition. And by distinctiveness, I mean how varied and complex that habitat type is. Now, these are set within the metric, so we can't change them. We've, the natural England have already made that decision, but something like woodland would have a higher distinctiveness than an arable field or an amenity grassland. That's kind of the way that it works. And you multiply these elements by your area to get your baseline biodiversity value in biodiversity units and units is the currency we're trading in within the metric. Post development, so after your developments occurred, this is what you're left with. It takes the habitats that are left or retained or created and it adds in habitat distinctiveness again, the predicted habitat condition, um, but it also factors in the difficulty of creating habitat and the target time to reach target condition. So for example, if you're creating new woodland, it, there's obviously a certain amount of difficulty in planting trees, get them to establish. And also for woodland to reach a defined condition will take a set amount of time. So the metric does factor in how difficult habitat is to create and how long it takes. And that gives you your post habitat biodiversity units. This slide here is my front lawn. This is year two. So you can create habitat relatively easily, some habitat types. I'm not saying it's all easy, but we can deliver quite a lot of biodiversity gain on a small site. And my neighbors think I'm mad. But anyway, so biodiversity net change. So what we're looking at is the after development units taking away your baseline units. And what we're hoping with is that you're left with a net gain rather than a net loss. If we need to achieve gain, there are two ways we can do this. We can do this through habitat enhancement, be it habitat on site or habitat off site, or we can do habitat creation. And what I mean by enhancement is getting a habitat to a better ecological condition. So this could mean planting 
wildflower plugs in a meadow to go from something like dull amenity grassland to species rich meadow like I'm showing here or it could mean coppicing woodland to let some more light in benefit the ground flora and improve the condition of the habitat in that way something we do need to be aware of though is that habitat creation has to somewhere be part of the biodiversity net gain mix otherwise we'll get to a situation where we're all trying to enhance the one area of retained habitat so we can't just have continued habitat loss we can't deliver it all through habitat enhancement and we should be thinking about an iterative approach so can we revisit the design can more habitat be retained can we do more on site to increase biodiversity value if we can't do it on site can we do it off site if we don't have ready access to land off site then can we pay somebody to do that for us and this is what's known as an offset and we can pay people to deliver biodiversity for us off site if it's not possible to do it on site and a quick thought about where offsetting money will go this largely depends on the local authority they all have their own priorities depending on local circumstances but if we're paying to deliver biodiversity off-site because a particular development is having an effect on biodiversity then ideally we would deliver the biodiversity gain in the same locality it doesn't really make sense for building in London to be offset by habitat increases in Scotland for example although there will be circumstances I'm sure and the government has recognized this where if we can show substantial biodiversity gain somewhere away from the development it might make sense to put all of your resources in one area so I don't know I can I can think of large-scale developments where it might not be possible to do anything on site we might be in a heavily congested urban area it might make more sense to do the biodiversity gain somewhere else and to create a new country park or something with um, you know much larger added value there are companies that can deliver this for you um, at the moment some local authorities are geared up to deliver net gain some aren't and it can be difficult for developers to find the right partners to achieve this there are companies that can act as brokers on your behalf putting landowners who have the land in touch with those that want to do the habitat creation and RSK Wilding is a new business venture for RSK looking to do just that and that will be the subject of our next webinar so quite exciting times working for RSK at the moment it's quite a forward-looking company so that's kind of how the metric works I've not gone into any detail and the DEFRA metric is just an accounting tool it's a tool it's it's nothing complicated well it's complex but it's nothing difficult about it it you do need to understand how it works and you do need to understand the pitfalls with it but it in essence it's nothing more than an excel spreadsheet that's all it is and you're plugging in areas and you're getting out values at the end so implications for achieving net gain on site the first thing and perhaps the most important is it does take space so if we're going to retain or create habitat we need an area to deliver that it's not something you can shoehorn into the corner so this does require early planning and consideration it's not an afterthought it will require changes to existing site management practices a good example would be grassland management most amenity grassland in the UK is gang main on something like a fortnightly basis if we're suggesting that we change to species rich grassland that's generally managed by an annual hay cut that will have implications for machinery how we deal with the hay arisings all of that sort of thing and that's not that's not a simple process to to get to I've had problems with my own lawn it's only a small lawn but I suddenly ended up with a great big mound of hay at the end of this summer what on earth do you do with that I've had to buy a composting license bin from the local authority and I've gradually begun getting rid of it week by week and the rest of it's gone on the compost heap but I don't have room to compost that volume of material that type of thing really and there will be cost implications so local planning authorities are suggesting that if you can't deliver biodiversity gain on site and you need to deliver it off site through an offset then a cost will be in the region of 10 to 15k per biodiversity unit and these are at the relatively conservative end um, some local authorities are suggesting 20 to 30k per biodiversity unit so it's not cheap 
We also, to some extent, have competition with other ecosystem services and functions. So a, a set area of land can deliver many functions. So it could be food production, flood protection, carbon sequestration, public community. We need to be looking, can we maximize these functions? So can we deliver biodiversity gain? Can we deliver flood, flood protection as well? Could we also deliver public community with that? We need to make our developments and our biodiversity offsetting as sustainable as possible. And what that means is thinking about things like carbon, thinking about things like climate. Can we maximize these functions? Land use to enhance biodiversity also needs to be protected um, in the long term, ideally in perpetuity. But perpetuity is a problem word for people, it's a problem word for developers, it's a problem word for local authorities, because what do we mean by perpetuity? So at the moment, um, most management agreements are suggesting periods of something like 25 to 30 years for managing and delivering habitat creation. But if we're thinking of something like ancient woodland, we should be thinking in terms of two, three, five hundred, maybe a thousand years. So we we need to get to the stage where we're thinking longer term than we currently think. And ideally, we get to a situation where we're not continually building on areas that we've just created enhanced for habitat. It will require a change in mindset as well, I think, from both us, the ecology industry, and also the development industry. We need to learn to think outside of the box. We need to maximize partnership working, and we need to learn to cooperate a lot more than perhaps we have done to date. At the moment, development and ecology can seem quite adversarial, particularly with local authorities and objectors and this whole mix. And we need to learn to um, work together a bit more, I think. So three, three case studies that I think are interesting for um, various reasons. First is Ibrook Reservoir, not an obvious site for biodiversity net gain. However, um, this is a former water supply works for steel industry. The client's Tata Steel, it's a triple SI. And the Environment Agency, we all remember dam failure, I think it was Yorkshire a few years ago. So the Environment Agency has been looking at dam structures across the UK. And this one is a Victorian dam structure and the dam face is deemed to be at risk of failure in an extreme flood event. So in order to reduce the potential for this happening, they're looking to create a spillway in one corner. That's at the top end of the plan here. And the bottom of the plan, that rectangle, is where we're going to deliver the net gain for this. And biodiversity is clearly not a prime driver for the emergency spillway works. The prime driver is risk of failure and loss of human life. So this one, the woodland you can see here, this is where the spillway will be created. It's on quite a steep slope. So what will happen is we create a sort of open embayments that will be lined that will channel the water and then the water will simply throw through the rest of the retained woodland down the slope over the concrete embankment into the eye brook that's the um, stream at the bottom of the dam the one that was dammed originally and the field on the right hand side this is the large open field where we would deliver the biodiversity net gain you can see it's got a bit of a hole in it. This is where the material for the dam was excavated originally. And this is where we are going to be importing the material excavated from the spillway and also the bark chip and wood mulch material that will come from the sort of couple of hectares of broadleaf woodland that will be lost. So there's a certain sort of fulfilling of circles here where material was excavated, material is coming back in again. So it kind of works quite well. So the key points from this one, the developer, the client had room to accommodate net gain. However, if we're just planting light for like replacement, um, new woodland for loss of woodland, we don't get anywhere near enough um, biodiversity units to give us the net gain that we need. But what we have found is that if we added flower rich grassland to it, added ponds to the mix, we were able to get enough biodiversity units to achieve a 10% net gain. 
there are some implications here because the field is grazed we have a tenant farmer and it has involved a bit of compromise where we're going to allow grazing as part of the establishment and management of the grassland in perpetuity um, and it just emphasizes that these things are complicated and not as simple as we might think lots of interested parties and we've also had a number of protected species issues to deal with here um, these have been dealt with in the normal way this is include badgers closing of badger sets checking of trees for bats we have found the dobenton's maternity roost we've had to think about timing of works for wintering birds because of the triple si status we've needed a sense from natural england and this site is also complicated in that the local planning authority boundary runs through the middle of reservoir runs through the middle of the reservoir so currently we have planning permission for the tree felling and creating of the spillway we don't yet have planning permission for the biodiversity net game because it's two separate planning authorities so this is quite complicated but it's getting there and we've almost resolved it although I did hear last week that badges have dug back in again so it's not without its problems this site okay right then so case study two so this is Grassmoor lagoons and the point about Grassmoor is um it, it was delivered before biodiversity net gain came on the scene so we, we have to bear this in mind what i'd like you to see first is the before so it's quite a complex site quite a complex suite of habitats and after where we have less habitat diversity so grassmore lagoons was a former colliery site near chesterfield it, the water's received runoff from former colliery waste and effluent, so nasty, nasty stuff. 2008, Derbyshire County Council wished to remediate the site, partly to deal with the danger of the lagoons, but also to protect the environment, protect water quality, and prevent pollutants from migrating and leaching out of the site, and also to increase the area available for public community as it backs on and is part of a, of a larger country park. So this is a major landscaping scheme filling in most of the open void and restoration back to species rich grassland. So although biodiversity enhancement wasn't the prime driver, it was considered as part of the restoration and factored in. But we have to remember this predates the DEFRA metric. So before, characteristic, very, very nasty, contaminated brownfield site. But as I alluded to earlier in the presentation, brownfield sites can be exceptionally good for wildlife and this was no exception because um, brownfield sites generally are polluted contaminated can have very low nutrient substrate they can give rise to quite important biodiversity habitat and grass mill was no exception so we did have existing areas of fairly species rich grassland bare ground that supported annual and ephemeral plant communities. These are quite scarce in the environment just because they, they tend to be early in the successional stage. And as we'd had a significant period since sites operations had stopped, the existing biodiversity value was, was quite significant at Grassmore. It, it was a nice brownfield site in that sense, um, although obviously contaminated. So the benefits of the restoration are, as we would expect, remediation of contaminants, prevention of pollution migration, site now safe for public access, much larger area available. And we also had a fairly good restoration scheme. They tried two or three different grassland seed mixes and it, and it worked quite well. Overall, um, there were some losses though. So we have lost some habitat for diversity and heterogeneity loss of woodland, loss of scrub, and loss of some of the wetland and ephemeral plant communities. They were quite limited what they could do with grass more due to the contamination. So tree planting was out, for example, they didn't want to do anything that was likely to disturb what was buried. So overall they had, um, grassland creation was what they had. Um, and overall we do have um, a fairly good net gain in biodiversity. But, and the important point with this is, Despite overall loss of habitat, we have gained a much larger area of flower rich grassland. So we've lost some habitat diversity, we've got a more homogeneous site, but overall we do have a net gain. And this is because they, they tried quite hard, low nutrient substrate, various seed mixes were tried, but we also had remnant grassland around the edge, which obviously rained seed into the area. So overall, it was quite a success. But the project, the point I want to make here, that if we did this today, the use of the metric would have helped 
recognise the existing biodiversity value and give a value to it in terms of biodiversity units. And this would have enabled us to do a biodiversity led remediation scheme and we could have ensured net gain with known outputs really. So although overall this scheme has been a success, there, there was no guarantee it would work. And I just think the metric and being able to um, have a have a known value of the site before you start although the biodiversity was recognized in in this scheme we we weren't able to attach a sort of biodiversity unit value to it and by using the metric we would have known what we needed to achieve um, post remediation to achieve net gain so it's just that the the metric here would have been a very had it been available would have been a very useful tool to enable them to think about what they needed, you know, their existing biodiversity um, in units, the habitat diversity that they had, and although they're only able to create a, a single habitat type, it does give them an idea about what they would need to achieve. And maybe this would have helped narrow down the choice of seed mix and um, help with informed sort of future management and that type of thing. So that that's the point I want to make with this is the metric is a very useful tool because we can think about existing value and it gives us uh, an idea about what we need to achieve to deliver net gain. Now this is site X, it's a real site but I didn't quite have client permission to use the graphics so I've just moved it by 300 miles but the intention is is the same and the parameters are the same or very similar. So it's an arable field, um, it needs to be close to the road, the client needs to put some industrial development in, but they are heavily constrained by the size of the site and what they need to deliver. And the only area that they have available for net gain is the green area on the end. And this is also where they need to deliver their attenuation ponds for flood protection. So this is um, very close to home. It's not actually happening here, but it's the parameters the same. So just to give you an idea. So this is the developer is particularly constrained on this site. Now, we revisited um, a net gain calculation and appraisal that was done by a competitor. To be fair, the competitor did a reasonable job. The habitat creation that they were looking at, what they could create on site, given that the site was heavily constrained, was reasonable but the client wasn't overly happy with the assessment because they're showing an 8% net loss and therefore they need to contribute for offsite mitigation to make the offset to deliver sort of 10% net gain overall and that's estimated at 200k so it's not an insignificant amount of money. We had a look in quite a lot of detail at this and considered that if we actually raise the aspirations on this site and looked at much better post condition, post development condition of the habitats that we could create that actually we could reduce the net loss from 8% to 1%. So although we still haven't achieved net gain, what we have done is maximize the biodiversity gain on site and we've reduced the cost for offsetting. But just to a, a point here is, although it looks just like playing with numbers, there are some implications here, because if we're increasing the aspirations, we're going to have to justify and detail how we're actually going to achieve the post development condition of the habitats that we're indicating. So if we're raising expectations, we ought to need to raise our game in terms of setting out the landscaping scheme, the planting scheme, the habitat management strategy, the management prescriptions, all of that. So we are going to be held to account for this. And that's the point with net gain in the metric. If you say you're going to do something, you have to give people confidence that you're actually going to deliver what you say you're going to do. So it's not just a matter of playing with numbers. Playing with numbers has implications. And these are my last points really. So just to kind of sum up, um, these are my good practice principles. They are partly my own thoughts and also partly coming from some excellent guidance that's out there, which I'll discuss briefly in a minute. And the first thing is we still need to remember that we need to be thinking about the mitigation hierarchy. We need to be thinking about avoidance first, then mitigate. So just because we can pay to deliver biodiversity and net gain offsite doesn't mean that we should be approving development in inappropriate places. 
we need to avoid impacts on irreplaceable biodiversity. So if possible, we shouldn't be building on ancient woodland. There are obviously cases where that's not possible. HS2 is a good example in the news at the minute. We also need to be thinking about not developing on designated statutory and non-statutory sites as well. Early engagement, I think. We need to be engaging with local authorities early, understand their priorities, how they want to deal with biodiversity net gain. Local authorities are taking slightly different approaches to this. There are some authorities who are used for the DEFRA pilot scheme. They tend to be slightly further forward. Um, Worcestershire and Warwickshire are quite good examples. And for development here, where sites are allocated in the local plan, what these local authorities are doing is giving the developer a development brief saying, basically, we want your master plan to look something like this. These are the habitats we expect to be preserved. These are what we expect you to mitigate for. This is what we expect the net gain compensation to look like. Give us development that looks something like this. We also need to be biodiversity led, or at least I would like us to be, um, although I'm not that naive to think that all development is biodiversity led. And I do recognise that there are many competing constraints here. So when we're considering development, you know, we have sites that might be heavily constrained because they need to deliver X amount of industrial units. Space might be very small. We have to consider factoring in things like traffic, air quality, water, all, all, all things that, you know, big development needs to think about. But the point is, is that biodiversity needs to be up there really right at the front end. We need to make space for it as well. We can't shoehorn net gain into a corner. If you're losing good quality habitat, you need to be creating habitat of at least equal, if not better quality and equal, if not better area. So if you're losing a block of woodland, you're going to have to probably deliver four or five times the size of that, depending on what you're putting forward. So it's going to take space. We need to innovate as well. We need to be a bit more forward thinking than perhaps we are. Um, in some cases, losing habitat in one area might enable you to deliver much more habitat in another area. I reviewed a, a sort of legal case recently where the developer was objecting to having to achieve 10% net gain because it's not mandatory yet. The um, local authority were pushing for that, but actually um, the inspector sort of upheld the development, the developers um, gripes as it were. And what we actually got, if you look at the scheme in detail, is they're moving an area of species rich grassland, they're translocating it, but by translocating it, they open up a much bigger area for management and public access. And overall, we're getting over a million quid's worth of biodiversity gain. So we might not be getting 10% net gain, but we're still getting a significant contribution. So Ecologists, if we can swallow occasionally the loss of good quality habitat, it might actually mean that we can do something better elsewhere. So we need to innovate and also can we maximise gain? Can we deliver amenity flood protection in the same areas? You know, does our flood protection have to be underground concrete lagoons? Can we actually have on-site attenuation ponds that deliver wetland habitat, for example? And the final point, I think, is we need to be transparent about this and we need to show our working and we need to show our assumptions because if we're delivering net gain offsite, that needs to be accountable. So people need to see that money has paid for X and X has been delivered on site Y. And also, if we're saying that we're going to create habitat of a certain condition post development, then we need to show in reasonable terms, how we're actually going to achieve that, because local planning authorities and regulators are going to need to understand, you said you're going to create species rich grassland, so how are you going to do that? Are your site conditions right? What's your management plan? What are your management prescriptions? And that's quite important, because the, the metric is just, a, as I said before, it's just an Excel spreadsheet, but we do need to show our workings and assumptions and how we're going to get to where we said we would, because you can play with numbers all day and come out with all sort of um, magic suggestions and magic formulas from it. But at the end of the day, we're going to be held to account for that. And finally, this is quite new to all of us. Um, but if you do bring a good ecology team on board earlier, you're going to minimise your disruption and ensure that we can maximise biodiversity and deliver some good stuff, really. I'm quite cynical. I've been an ecologist for a long time, but I'm actually quite enthused by 
net gain because I think for the first time we've actually got something that's mandated. We've got something that we can use as a as a bit of a stick as well as a um, to force gain from sites. Um, and I think overall it could make a real difference if it happens in the right way. And we've got an opportunity, I think, but we need to make sure that it that it happens in the right way and it's up to us to deliver, I think. I did just mention some good practice guidance. Um, there's three documents that have been produced. They're available on the SIEM website. SIEM was one of the partners in pulling these together, as was Syria. So we have good practice principles, a good practice guide, and also net gain case studies. And I would recommend that everybody reads these. So you'll be able to take the web links um, from the recording, um, but do have a look. They're quite good reading, not too long, and they do help set the scene for you. Um, and that's the slide I'm going to end on. So that's the, any questions slide? <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, if you'd like to put your webcam back on again, uh, yeah, we can uh, have a look right. at some of the questions that have come in while you've been talking. So we've got a whole range of questions. I'm not sure we're going to get through them but we'll try to do as many as we can. Um, there's a couple of related questions about who determines whether you've done enough on on the site to justify biodiversity net gain off-site. So at what point do you get to um, do you get to move off-site and it's agreed that you've done enough? I think this is where you need to talk to the local planning authority I guess so the, re the regulator for your development so who you know who who gives your development permission, I think. And this is this is where you need to be upfront and clear. This is where you need to show you're working. So if you can't, if you can deliver some gain on site, but you can't deliver all of it, then you just need to show you're working. And then if you're delivering off site, you need to make sure that you that you're going through a recognized um sort of delivery partner really that has the um correct procedures and mechanism in place to be accountable. So it's not just you paying a local farmer to do it. You'd need to go through something like RSK Wilding or something local, some local authorities have their own systems for doing this. But the important thing is, is that there is that sort of accountability chain in place, if that makes sense. And then once you've got your strategy laid out, then that will form part of your planning application and gets determined that way, I think. I think that's how it works to my mind. Thanks, Mark. Um, I've got one around um, if your project is classified as temporary or short term. So we're talking quite long short term here. So say a solar farm that's going to yeah. be operational for 20 to 30 years, but yeah. you're using woodland for screening purposes. Yeah. Should this be a biodiversity net gain, but it'll take longer to achieve than the proposed development actually lasts 32 years in the metric. So how would a local planning authority react to this? I think you can show that as net gain because you you factored in the time to condition and we, we've touched on this already. So I think what the local authority would need to understand is what happens to that woodland in the long term. So are there proposals and a mechanism and a suitable management plan in place to make sure that that woodland will exist for the amount of time it needs to do. So even if it's in place after your development has occurred, finished and gone away, as long as you can show there's a suitable mechanism to secure that site for the ideally in perpetuity. But as we said before, perpetuity is a word that has a few problems with it. Um, that's what we would need to be showing, I think, that the, the woodland is in place for a sufficient amount of time and that you can show that there's a mechanism to deliver that. So is there a Section 106 agreement to safeguard it or whatever? Will there be an agreement that means that the landowner won't just rip it out, that he's obliged to protect and maintain it for a set period of time? Is how I would suggest. Thanks, Does that Mark. help? Um, yeah. <laughs> the um, difficult I've question. noticed that a few... I notice that a few people have got their hands up in the in the uh, panel there. I have no means to unmute you to um, ask your questions directly. So if you if you want to ask a question, do put it in the in the chat box, uh, in the questions box rather. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I have one here. Um, Mark, thanks for the presentation. What would be the implications for developers if post-construction monitoring shows that created or enhanced habitats 
aren't achieving the condition or distinctiveness scores that were predicted in the BNG calculations, would they potentially be liable to paying for additional offsetting? Yes, potentially, unless we can have a feedback mechanism to address the issues while they're not achieving the condition. So it's understanding what the problem is. So if it's, I mean, ideally, you would have a management plan in place with a feedback loop that would account for this. So if your woodland planting isn't establishing, why isn't it establishing? Do you need to replant? Do you need to water more? What What are the problem conditions. If you have something like a nutrient problem with grassland, you're not getting species rich grass and you're getting too much grass growth, can you think about methods to remediate that? So could we put yellow rattle seed in to help parasitize the grass or something? So I would hope I would hope that we would have been forward thinking enough and pragmatic enough to understand what we could actually deliver on our site and that we haven't tried to claim we can deliver something that's not possible because then we're getting our knickers in a twist um, but I would also I would also hope that we would be able to factor in some of these with the management prescriptions that's the important thing is making sure that monitoring is linked to management so if monitoring is showing a problem then management is doing something to deliver that in terms of site management so we should be able to deal with it that way. Brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'll grill you for a few more, but um, we're not going to get through all of them. There are a lot of questions and we will try to answer as many as we can afterwards directly. Um, who is legally responsible, I suppose connected to that last question, who's legally responsible for making sure biodiversity net gain is actually carried out and monitored as planned? So in the way that for protected species, it could be a license consideration. What's the equivalent for this? And then... Um, yeah, no, I think that question is slightly separate. Uh, I'll let you answer that one first. Yeah, okay, good good question. Um, I think the local planning authority ultimately will insist, and we, we haven't yet seen a lot of these schemes come to fruition, so that's a difficult question to answer. But I would think, so if you're using something like a broker to deliver stuff off-site, then the broker that you're using, something like RSK Wilding, would, would need to be the responsible agent to make sure that it happens. Um, otherwise, I think we would need to be looking at something like a section 106 agreement where it's clearly set out who are the defined partners and who is responsible for it delivering because we've all had experience of um, schemes where, you know, you get to implement um, recommendations made in an EIA and nobody can quite understand who's responsible. So I think we would need to set out at the outset who would be legally responsible for implementation and who for management so in a similar way to the way that your protected species licensing will set it out but that's not to say that it won't have its problems because we still have problems with people enforcing and monitoring licensing and ensuring that mechanism is, is quite a difficult thing to do but that there, there are you know things like section 106 there are ways to do that but i i do think it's a problem and something that we would need to work as and when we start developing and pushing more of these schemes forward. There's quite a famous case in, uh, I think it's Cambridgeshire or Northamptonshire, where they translocated a triple SI and the translocation went very well. It was to accommodate the A1, but now the triple SI is in very, very poor condition because nobody's actually monitored or managed the site. So despite the regulator Natural England knowing the site is in poor condition, they can't decide amongst themselves who's responsible for grazing it. So it's actually been a failure because it's now scrubbed up with no grazing. And this is the type of thing that can happen. And it's because there's no clear determination of who's responsible up front. I think it's slightly easier where it's delivered off-site because you will reach a legal agreement with the landowner who's who's providing the habitat creation facilities for you and he'll you know there'll be a standard legal agreement for a period of x number of years to deliver um but yes it's 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 having an appropriate mechanism in place and agreeing it up front i think and that's liaison with the local planning authority and regulators Thanks, Mark. And somebody, despite me saying I'm not answering any questions, somebody said it may be a question for Steph from a policy perspective. <laughs> are there any plans in the offing for considering BNG measures targeted at species? In parts of the US, they're looking at credits for, for example, wildlife crossings to improve connectivity. I realize BNG is in its relative infancy, but are there any hints in the ether? Um, 
Ooh, more than hints, probably. And BNG in its infancy, that shows how fast the years have started to whir past. I think the first the first pilots for Biodiversity Net game were 2012. Um, yeah. We're talking about it becoming mandatory in 2023 after the implementation period. So yeah, that, that's a big infant. Um, so from a policy perspective, um, there's no plans to extend Biodiversity Net gain specifically to look at species but there are plans afoot to move to a wider consideration of other ecosystem services and natural capital issues through a kind of environmental net gain approach, if you like. Um, and we are seeing the amendments in the um, environment bill coming through that relate to species conservation strategies, which are a, a, a similar sort of thing, looking at species issues more strategically, similarly to the um, Great Crested Newts District Level Licensing Scheme, to see if we, if by taking a more strategic view, we can deliver greater benefits at a, a landscape or ecosystem scale. So um, it's, it's a time of huge policy change. And, um, and I think we can expect to see lots of evolution in, in practice over the next few years to, to keep on top of. Um, hopefully, that doesn't mean adding new initiative on top of new initiative, but it means that we can streamline them, bring together and, you know, make things smoother and potentially faster by dealing with these things strategically at an early stage in the planning process rather than on a site by site basis. I think I have probably grilled Mark for long enough. We're a little bit <laughs> over time. So I'm going to let him off at this point. There are a lot of questions still in the box and we will reply to you directly where we can. Um, uh, and um, so all that remains for me to say is thank you very much for joining us today. Um, our next first Thursday presentation is on the 7th of January and the speaker that week will be John Davis from RSK Wilding who's going to talk about using rewilding to achieve biodiversity net gain and other natural capital benefits. So we hope to see you then. Good. Thank you very much for joining us today um, and uh, we'll see you in January. Have a very nice Christmas. Yeah, and have a good, yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> really enjoyed that.